This isn't just a state problem or a regional problem. The nation, the nation as a whole actually lost jobs in January, then lost more jobs in February, and in March, and in April, and in May, and in June. May's jump in unemployment was the largest in 22 years. Now, I've often said that if you want to understand this country, you should come to Ohio. The people, the places, the life of Ohio offer a bit of almost everything that you'll find anywhere in America. And I think that's one of the greatest things about living here. But a big, diverse American state like Ohio must face the challenges of the American economy. In a time of shifting consumer demand, we've seen the doors shuttered on Ohio plants that for generations built products of the highest quality. In a time of corporate consolidations, we've seen Ohio jobs shipped away and chipped away. You know, it's tempting to look for a quick fix to help the Ohio economy out of this national slump, but this isn't the time to stick some chewing gum in the crack and hope it holds. We have an opportunity here to make a long-term commitment, a commitment to strengthening Ohio and reclaiming the Ohio prosperity that has defined this state since its earliest days. That's why we passed a job stimulus package recently that will dedicate $1.57 billion to creating jobs and laying the foundation for future economic growth. That's why we made a historic commitment to education. From preschools to graduate schools to workforce training, we've increased funding and access and made it easier for Ohioans to gain skills to fill positions in high demand career fields. And that's why we passed an energy bill that will protect Ohio jobs by ensuring the availability of reliable electric service and supply while preventing the kind of devastating overnight increases in electricity prices, increases of more than 70% that some states have endured. And this new electricity law requires the expanded use of advanced energy technologies, giving us a greener source of power and the potential to see dramatic job gains in making the tools necessary to harvest the next generation of energy. What's more, we will create a major new market for Ohio's agricultural products a source of economic vitality for Ohio for nearly two centuries. But as we take action, we must also answer this charge against us, this charge that we are battered, depressed, and in decline. Have we really fallen so far behind that we can never catch up? Now, there are a lot of folks who love to talk about the fast-growing economy in the South. They're the Sun Belt, where everything is new, warm, and vibrant. But we're cast as the Rust Belt, old, cold, corroded, and headed for the scrap heap. It's interesting to see what the experts have to say. The Federal Reserve Bank here in Cleveland has put out a number of reports in the last few years with heady titles, titles like the long-run determinants of state income growth. Their economists have found that the South has outpaced the rate of growth in the rest of the country, and they wondered how the rest of the country could produce similar results. But there's something in their research that I find really interesting. If you look back over the last 70 years, you'll see that Mississippi, Mississippi has grown at an amazing rate. 
using constant dollars, their per capita income actually grew more than 1,100% over 70 years. By any measure, that's an impressive rate of growth. For comparison, over the same period, Midwest states like Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, those states saw their per capita income rise by about 500%. But here's something that kind of gets overlooked in the celebration of the Sun Belt's growth. When you look at where Mississippi started before all of that income growth, you see that their per capita income was dead last among the states during the 1930s. And today, after more than an 1,100% growth, Mississippi's per capita income ranks dead last. So even as the Federal Reserve Research celebrates growth in the South, the bottom line is that those states grew the fastest because they were the farthest behind to begin with. We're not going to match the growth or the growth rate of states that have far fewer assets than do we. That's just a fact. But we can and we are bigger and stronger and more prosperous. You know, foxtail weeds grow pretty fast. Those weeds can double in size in just a few days. A mighty oak can't match that. But which would you rather be? The power of perception is at work here. If self-pity did any good, I would be all for it. But a negative self-image undercuts a community's morale, and it undercuts a community's prospects. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Why should investors go where people have given up on themselves? You know the old line, a lie will go around the world while the truth is pulling on its boots. Well, it seems to me that about every bad thing folks feel about Ohio gets shouted through a bullhorn, and every good thing is whispered. And this matters in everything we do. So I'm suggesting that today we take a lesson from a, a model city, a model metropolitan area, a place that we should emulate and aspire to replica replicate. This is a place with a lower cost of living than cities like Phoenix or Orlando or Seattle or even Mexico City. Its cost of living is even lower than towns like Danville, Illinois. It's a place where with a higher in household income than Tampa or Albuquerque or Pittsburgh. It has a higher percentage of people in the so-called creative class than does Portland or Indianapolis or Honolulu. And with more people employed in the arts than Houston or Milwaukee or Miami. It's rated a more sustainable city than Atlanta or Charlotte or Jacksonville. It's rated more literate get this, more literate than New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, or Los Angeles. The quality of life is rated higher than Minneapolis or St. Louis or Rome or Hong Kong or Rio de Janeiro. My friends, the place I've just described is Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> 